I'm here in Germany doing something I never expected to do as an ex-Jehovah's Witness activist. I'm helping a Bethelite, a staff member at the Central European branch of Jehovah's Witnesses based here in Selters, to leave after over five years working at this facility, thus embarking on a new life as someone who no longer believes the Jehovah's Witness religion to be true. Now, to be clear, it's not as if this guy is actually escaping from the Selters facility itself. He's arranged it with his superiors and they know he's leaving. It's not like he's going to be digging his way out through a tunnel or anything. At least I hope not. But in the context of his Jehovah's Witness connections and the huge expectations on his shoulders as a soon-to-be former Bethelite, this is very much an escape as I will explain more in voiceover. Bethelites, you see, are not quite like other Jehovah's Witnesses. Bethelites devote themselves to work full-time for the Jehovah's Witness organization, living and working at its facilities, which are often referred to as Bethels. Bethel is a Hebrew word meaning house of God, so the implication is that if you are a Bethelite, you're not just close to God, you're pretty much sleeping on his sofa. In addition to their accommodation, Bethelites receive free meals and have other basic needs cared for. In return, they sign a vow of poverty pledging to not do any outside work unless by arrangement and promise to hand over any surplus funds to the organization. They also receive a meager allowance which for United States Bethelites works out at just $150 per month. In Germany, it's a bit more, with our Bethelite pocketing a still modest 207 euros for a month of full-time work. All of this means that Bethelites live a frugal, monastic lifestyle, overwhelmingly surrounded by other Bethelites and completely immersed in the Jehovah's Witness religion on a day-to-day -day basis. Apart from his vow, nothing is stopping our man from just walking out the door and, as mentioned, he has permission to leave. But if he leaves in the wrong way, or suspicions are raised that he may be in contact with apostates, he faces almost instant disfellowshipping and shunning by his family, with whom he has carefully planned to spend valuable weeks helping both them and him adjust to the next chapter in his life. In other words, he can't just leave, he needs to leave on his own terms. It's also worth mentioning that for a Bethelite to not just decide to leave, but allow former members to help document their exit on camera has never been done before. But conveniently for me, as someone whose mastery of the German language leaves much to be desired, it just so happens this particular Selters Bethelite is like me originally from the UK, which made it much easier over the previous few weeks for us to make our plans. Now the actual escape is planned for tomorrow morning, but before we show you that part of the story, let's go back in time to a couple of days ago when I was in my bunker studio in Croatia with my video editor Tibor planning this trip. You see, Selters is unlike any other branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world. As ex-Jehovah's Witness activists, we are filming here at our peril, as a colleague of mine explained in a call from Australia. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. You are obviously the head of operations at JW Watch, and you're also a legal advisor for us. And it's kind of on that basis that I want to talk to you, because as you know, we're planning a trip to Germany to pick up a friend who's a Bethelite. I've never done any filming in Germany before, and I'm kind of conscious about not breaking any German laws, especially since we're going to be potentially filming in or around a Bethel complex. Do you have any advice for us? Oh, I have a question. Are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into, Lloyd? It's um, not bad, is it? It is that bad. The Central European branch of the Jehovah's Witness organisation has become very litigious in more recent years. Um, and I really, it concerns me. Um, you're an activist. Um, any opportunity they get, especially um, in light of more recent events, 
with, you know, talks about activists and the damage that activism is obviously doing to the organisation, they, you know, you need to be very careful. There was a court case in 2019, um, Regina Spies, I'm pretty sure. I remember sure you... that. We did that for, was it Watch Time and Focus, now JW Watch? We did cover that story, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, she was ultimately found to be not guilty in terms of defamation, but the, the pains that she went through during the court case to, to prove herself to be innocent and on what was a very innocuous um, statement, basically uh, just saying that, you know, that the organisation manipulates family members, which um, obviously on the basis that she was found not guilty um, was the fact that it's substantially true. Um, it, it's a lot. It, it concerns me that the, the amount of time and, and effort that would require you to defend yourself in a claim like that, it's concerning. So they are litigious when it comes to defending themselves on basis of defamation and libel. Wasn't yeah. there also, uh, well, Misha, Misha Anouk? Yeah. They went after him, didn't they? Absolutely. And and what concerned me mostly about his um, his case was the fact that it was four years after his book had been um, po- uh, published, you know, um, is it called Goodbye Jehovah, if I remember rightly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and, and interestingly, the points, you know, he made a lot of points in that, in that book. It was extremely interesting. Um, he, they picked up two of the more um, mundane concerns, shall we say, that the organisa- we have with the organisation. Um, and they seem to be politically based um, because it made their organisation look bad. Um, so, it, you know, it's hard to know exactly what they would come at you for so you know you I just think you need to be very very careful in terms of b- minimizing what you say to them being very polite you're there to pick up your friend um, and try not to engage in conversations because you just don't know what exactly they may pick up as an issue um, it, ultimately I know you speak in truth and we, we have facts to back up and evidence to back up but I'd rather try and avoid you know yourself and Tibor visiting a police station. (laughs) So even though I obviously love pursuing opportunities where possible to interact with actual believing Jehovah's Witnesses, on this occasion you're saying it would be better not to and to just stick to speaking to our friend when we pick him up. Absolutely. Yeah. And And just, you know... As factual as possible. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you know, de- common decency, hello, how are you? We're here to pick up our friend. Um, you know, they can't ask you to move on or to, to leave the area. You're well within your rights to be there. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't go on to say, hi, my name is Lloyd Evans and I'm an ex-JW activist. And what we are we allowed to do in terms of filming? Because, obviously, <laughs> we're trying to make a documentary that is about Celsius. Are we allowed to film as I'm guessing we're not allowed to go in because that would be trespassing, but are we, are we at least allowed to film it from the outside? You're not allowed to film inside the building without the owner's consent. Um, you're not allowed to enter the premise without the owner's consent, obviously. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much the limitations on filming. Well, there's a lot to think about. Basically, it all boils down to be truthful, be factual, and yeah, obey the laws. Be very regarding. careful. Be, be very careful, careful not to let them misconstrue any statement that could even remotely um, infer defamation or, you know, sort of damage to the organisation's reputation. Tibor, do you have any concerns? Not really. As long as we're polite, factual, and we put our charm on, I think we're we're ready to go. Are you saying I need to have charm, Tibor? <laughs> There's time to get some stuff. <laughs> long drive there. Okay. Well, uh, what's the worst that could happen? Um, if we do end up in a German jail, Kim, hopefully you can fly and bail us out. So I'll have my phone in. at the ready and hope I don't hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Kim. See you soon. No problem.
So, long story short, we went into this project with every reason to feel nervous about capturing on camera the story of a Bethelite leaving Celtas because he no longer believed the religion. And to make matters worse, things were about to get a lot more complicated. Okay, so last night I had a WhatsApp exchange with our friend in Germany. As you can see, we're all set to go, everything's packed up, we're going to be leaving first thing in the morning and just with a few hours to go before we help this guy get out of Celtas, things have got more complicated because it seems there's a witch hunt in progress. So I had this message, okay so I have a problem, I was called into a meeting with two big shot elders today and the topic apostate things. My mate who woke up has gone home. Probably should have mentioned there are multiple Bethelites involved here. My mate who has woke up has gone home and doesn't want to go to the meetings anymore and no desire to go in ministry. And now there is a witch hunt, either for who convinced him or who he convinced. I think they bought my story, which was he mentioned doubts before but they sounded like doubts. I told him to go to the elders and he told me he did. Anyway, all this means I want to play things super safe this week. I don't want to get anywhere near you guys until I'm far away from the branch, thinking I walk down to the train station and meet you there. So basically because someone else who woke up in Bethel has recently left, and they've gone to their family and started expressing their doubts to their family, basically apostate ideas. This has triggered in Celtas this witch hunt to find out how far this apostasy goes, whether this individual who's already out has influenced anyone in Celtas, and because our man was known to be an associate, he gets dragged in by these two elders and essentially interrogated as to what he knows and to whether he is himself an apostate or in touch with apostates. It seems they've bought his story, but he is understandably nervous. So I've been in touch with him more since this exchange and we're going to try and do the extraction as safely as possible. So there we are, the stakes are high, we've done all the planning we possibly can, everything's going to happen early tomorrow morning and at this point we just don't know how everything's going to go down. Tibor, I suggest we go back to the hotel, drink some beer, eat some breaded meat and try not to break any German laws in doing so, what do you reckon? Works for me. Okay. So I've just had a message from Ben. Obviously, we're just done filming now. We've just been doing some B-roll around Celtas. <laughs> and seeing Ben messaging me, I'm like, oh God, have we triggered the alarm? Is he, is Celtas now in lockdown or something? And he's like, what are you doing? Um, but I'll read the message. He says, uh, I will just say, bear in mind, I'm literally going from one extreme to the other. So it's already a very weird experience for me and it will be even stranger tomorrow. So I won't necessarily be jumping for joy or running out smiling into the world's embrace. It's kind of bittersweet, the whole thing. Just wanted to set expectations. Oh, I mean, okay. It's perfectly under understandable. You know, we literally have a person turning their wife 180 in front of us so just literally the only expectation or the only thing that we can wish for is for him being coherent basically and there's no way that he will be emotionally stable or even like sorted in his head i'm gonna be honest i wasn't expecting that in my mind you know again this is an escape this is liberation this is freedom and I think he knows it's freedom but I do now that he's putting it like this 
I do relate on how he can be torn genuinely, especially when there's no kind of neutral middle ground he's going into. It's literally he's going from one of the most well-known facilities of Watchtower to into the association, close association of one of the most well-known quote unquote apostates, and that is a huge contrast, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to come to terms with. Literally the opposite end of the spectrum, so... You've got so much ahead of him, and yeah. I don't really envy him in yeah. that sense, because I've been through it, and, and it, it's painful, it's tricky, it's messy, it's complicated, there are all sorts of unpleasant exchanges and conversations with his family lying in store. He knows all of this is ahead of him. So I, yeah, the more I think about it, the more I do understand he's not going to be skipping through those gates, doing a little, uh, doing a, a little clapping his heels together and saying, here I am, world. It's just not how it's going to work. This is the real deal, Tibor. Indeed. We're gonna go bag ourselves a Bethelite. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Of course, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we are, we're just gonna meet up with a good friend of mine and also a supporter of the channel, a patron, Ben. And he is going to be our extraction driver so because I am <laughs> some would say a well-known ex-Jehovah's Witness activist who could potentially ruffle some feathers among the CELTA's security personnel because we're driving also a car with Croatian plates which could also you know cause suspicion and or fear or paranoia and hence make things harder inside Celtas for our man. Um, we're gonna have a, a German driver. So yeah, we're, we're currently on our way to meet him and then it will be a very interesting process or mission of doing the extraction and then driving uh, to a recovery location that we've pre-selected where we're going to do a, an on-camera debrief with our Bethelite. But yeah, it's all about to go down. Shiz is getting real. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Indeed. How are you, pal? Hi, hi. How are you? <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, so had a good ride coming here. Yeah. Hey, Tibor. Hi. <laughs> nice yeah. seeing you. So, we, are you ready for our mission? Let's get it on. Oh, <laughs> <it's green. laughs> well, this is nerve-wracking. Um, the chaps have set off. And, uh, cameras are rolling, or will be soon. Yeah, it's just all about weeks of planning, all, boil, all boiling down to one moment, and we need this to work. We need this to go off without a hitch. No aggravation, no Bethel goons following us, please. So I've got the recovery location programmed in. I'm ready to lead our little convoy to essentially freedom. Some distance away from Celtas where we can get out and we can breathe and we can process this whole crazy situation. Goodness knows how things are going to go. Hello? Hi, how's it going? We're here and waiting. Are, are, any sign at all of our man? No, not yet. Okay, and you're in position, are you? 
We're in position in the street next to this, uh, directly up the street at the front. Okay, I will let him know that you're there. Yeah, perfect. I was just about to message you. Okay. Perfect. Good stuff. We're Cheers. Here. Here we are. Yes? Hello? Hi, you're all right. Yeah. I've just messaged him to say... Is, can you see him yet? No. Okay, I've just messaged him to let him know that you're outside. Can we just keep this channel open until you see him? Yeah, sure. For the sake of my nerves. <laughs> oh, nerve-wracking. It is. That's why I was laughing before all the time. I think I'm a bit nervous yet, but that's normal. It's not a normal thing to do every day. Hopefully he'll come into view soon. I mean, we only see him exactly, basically, when he comes to the car, so... Yeah. Well, it's now nine, so, yeah, this is, this is the time. Take a walk to look at the edge of the street. I mean, are we sure that he's not waiting by the entrance? No, he. I've told him exactly where you'll be parked. If you're, if you're where I showed you, Tibor, then it, it, he'll know that that's where you are. I mean, maybe if we draw up a bit, just so he. Can just... No, no, no. It, it's important that you stay a, a decent distance away. Okay, because we are quite a bit away. Maybe if he's behind the... You know what? Fence. I'm not filming, so I just take a walk and nothing can happen. Okay. Okay. Are you there, Tibor? Yeah. Oh, I think he's coming. Oh, brilliant. There's someone with a suitcase coming, yeah. That that must be him. Okay, just tell... Brilliant, I'm gonna leave you now. Take care. Take care. Hi there. Hey, good morning. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> How are you feeling? Um, hot? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Um, just take a turn here. Yeah. And you? <laughs> oh, I'll be in here again. We did the talk before. It's a couple of years I've been here. You were in Bethel? No, I wasn't in Bethel. Okay. Uh, visiting Bethel. I had friends cool. in Bethel. Nice. Oh, so they've got him. They've got him. Or he's got them. <laughs> I don't know who's got who, but the point is there has been a coming together. The extraction is underway and we now need to move from the extraction phase to the recovery phase, which is where I come in. <laughs> I'm still nervous, even though the extraction has apparently, I hope, gone well. Hopefully he wasn't followed out by Bethel goons. I'm still nervous. It's not over till it's over. It's Lenny Kravitz once said. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> it is, it is. It's so strange you can't just go. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I can't remember who I was talking to yesterday, but uh, I was saying it's a bit like, like kind of falling off a cliff. It's mm -hmm. like top of the world, Jehovah's Witness to in a car with one of the most prominent <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can't see any Watchtower goons following. So far we seem to have triumphed. 
Jehovah's Hand was with us. Oh, good. There was some kind of car mini that was behind um, the Quattro, and that's just turned off. <laughs> it's, I know it's completely unlikely, but you just want to see no cars, no cars at all. And there was a car following for a while. Well, not following, it was, it was on the road for a while behind the Quattro. And in the back of your mind, you're just thinking, could that be them? Could, could they have dispatched a car that quickly? Just to see what happened, see where, see where the car went. But that's just turned off, so there's literally, I'm looking behind the Quattro and there is nothing, nothing at all. So we've completely managed to get away without any without anyone following us, which is wonderful. It will be peace of mind for Ben. Uh, he wants as little stress as possible right now. He wants no fears or anxieties or any any possible basis for any kind of paranoia. He will be feeling good about having no cars following us and. Yeah, it will just give him that extra time to process things. Yeah, so it's like exciting, but kind of numb, mm. horrific, kind of numb. Mm. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah I, I can totally not relate to that. <laughs> uh, now when everything falls into place and you just come from A to B to C, and then um, yeah. I started to read a lot of stuff, also watched a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff. Yeah, I think as well because I've been like mentally planning, mm. maybe not this specific scenario, but <laughs> um, the whole shebang for like maybe since late last year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like, oh yeah, the plan's going, I'm ticking the stages for the plan off. Uh, that's such a, that's a really German way to say that. <laughs> I'm ticking the stages through the plan off. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, but it's somehow, yeah, it just feels like someone else is. Um, can I go a bit further? Oh, that's too fat. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Here we are. Is this location okay? Because the thing is, yeah. there's a road there, but no one from this no. distance will be able to no. see. Yeah, I, to be honest, this morning I was surprised how like no one was around. I was like, okay, this has worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> Were you sleeping with one eye open a little bit? Or? Uh, I didn't sleep very well, yeah, no. that's, uh, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should have slept like a baby. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, it's happened. It has. It, our plan has come together weeks in the making, months in the making. Months in the making, yeah. With the extraction and overwhelming success, we could now relax for a while in the beautiful windswept German countryside and allow our newly escaped Bethelite to take stock. I asked Ben how he was coping emotionally. To be honest, at the moment, it's a lot of numbness. Um, I, I was saying it's kind of like going from, or well, is going from one extreme to the other. Mm. And I think just in doing so, it, your, your mind kind of separates yourself from the process. It's like an out-of-body experience. Exactly, yeah. I, yeah. I kind of knew it was happening and I've, you know, been planning it, but now that it's happening, it feels like it's happening to someone else and I'm still in bed in soldiers. <laughs> in your mind, is there like a place that you're aiming to get to where you can finally breathe? Uh, well, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure, that sounds like a great, a great goal. I, I try not to set myself up for failure, so uh, mm. I guess I'll just take things as they go. It's, it, it's also going to be kind of weird because just coming from Bethel, now with you guys, then I go back to my parents for a bit who are um, witnesses, and then I'll, 
leave. So it's kind of in, out, in, out. Mm. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, uh, an adventure. Can you talk us through what you were doing kind of as a Bethelite? What, what was life like as a Bethelite? <laughs> Wow. Okay. Start with the easy questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, my job was in, uh, it's half in shipping and half in video team. Um, a lot towards the end was more in the video team side of things. Um, in the industry, it would, the, the role would be um, assistant production. Assist, <laughs> what's it called? Assistant, assistant director, first oh, AD. Okay. Right. But we call it APC, assistant production coordinator. That was my role, so assisting with budgeting and stuff and scheduling, do that day in, day out. And um, yeah, and then all the standard Bethel stuff as well, so morning worship and family watchtower study. And yeah, I, in lockdown it got, or it is still very strange. Um, things are opening up in America at the moment, um, in the branch, but here in Germany everything's still under restrictions right now. Mm. So, um, so it's quite, you're stuck in that environment. So you go to work and you come home and there's no rest bite, you know? It's a regimented life, isn't it? Yeah. Is it going to be weird to transition from such a regimented life to just doing things however you want to do? <laughs> I've, I've been saying that actually to everyone who's been asking, like, what's, how do you feel? What's, what's going to be the biggest change? And I said, right now, honestly, it feels so, so weird to think that I'm going to choose what to eat every day. Yeah. It's like a really genuinely weird thought. Like I just show up and eat, what, mm. and maybe I don't like it, but it is what it is. And yeah. But so every day, normal people are deciding what they eat. And it's yeah. like, I remember being normal like that. Are you pleased with how the extraction went? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a Saturday, if there's one thing you know about witnesses, Saturday morning they're going to be in ministry, so it's pretty smooth. Everyone was in their rooms on their Zoom calls, and mm. yeah, so so far so good. Yeah, as long as I don't end up dead in a ditch somewhere. Apart from that guy over there with binoculars, no one's watching us. So. <laughs> yeah. Considering the emotional upheaval he was clearly going through, I was relieved to see that Ben was in generally good spirits. It seemed, despite initial nerves, he felt genuinely relaxed with his new apostate friends. And I couldn't help but feel that our extraction driver, German Ben, or Ben Schultz, had played a huge part in putting Ben at ease with his friendly, welcoming demeanour. Before he left us, I pulled him to one side to thank him for his services. Ben. Not Bethelite Ben, but German Ben. German Ben. <laughs> Great, I love it. <laughs> Isn't it. It's not a very imaginative nickname, but it'll do for now. Um, thank you so much for being part of our little adventure. Yeah. Has this been more or less what you expected, or did you not know what to expect? Or? <sighs> Honestly, I didn't really know what to expect, but I yeah. was determined to go on the ride and yeah. take the opportunity meeting you, yeah. helping someone out, and maybe making my first step in front of the camera. So. If there's any Jehovah's Witnesses watching this who are perhaps Germans and they've seen this Bethelite escape and you're here as well helping and mm. they're, they're wondering, you know, what all of this means for their faith, yeah. what would be your message to them? Well, I would just tell them, be brave, have a look, examine. If you're watching, if they're watching this, they're taking the first step. There's nothing to be afraid of, mm. even though we have been, been told this all our life, basically. Mm. If something is true, you can examine it. There's so much out there to learn. There's a life out there. Mm. And it is hard at first. It might scare you. It did scare me mm. having my first looks. Um, but I can only say it's worth every while taking the step and looking at it and being able to live a more authentic and, and real life, basically. Mm. And if I can just say, I know that you've made a sacrifice to be here today because you know, without going into any details, you know, you're in a difficult family situation as someone who's out. So I really appreciate you yeah. taking that extra sacrifice for, for this project. Yeah, it was, it was fun being here. So I'm out, my family basically still in, yeah. which makes life a bit tense, of course. 
Mm. But I, well, wanted to be part of this and, and help others potentially. Yeah. That's worth it. The project was important for you. Definitely. I really appreciate that. With the escape over, all that remained was to begin our 13-hour drive back to my home in Croatia, where Ben would be given plenty of time and space to decompress. What we're going to do now is I'm going to take you to Croatia, to the Wolf Slayer, <laughs> uh, the nerve centre of international apostasy. And we've... <laughs> We've actually uh, got a place set up for you. There's a, a resort over the road from our house. Oh, it's a we've, resort? <laughs> we've, yeah, we've checked you into, it's actually a log cabin surrounded okay. by fields with deer. So you'll have your own log cabin. <laughs> you'll be, there's a, a swimming pool, a sauna and a jacuzzi. You'll be able to just relax for all of tomorrow. You'll, we're there if you want to see us, but if you don't want to see us, and you... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just too honest. <laughs> it's a bit too honest. To be honest. We'll, we'll, we'll cut that too bit soon, out. Too soon, too <laughs> soon. Um, but yeah, you can just relax tomorrow. And what I thought was, if in two days we can pick up the thread and we can... That will give you more time to process what's just happened. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Yeah, thank you. So viewers, you will see us two days later. Ben, it's two days later. We are at a resort that is conveniently just a couple of minutes away from where I live. And I've put you in this log cabin <laughs> so, so that you can hopefully process what's been happening because I think it was a stressful situation, wasn't it? When we boosted you from Celsius. You think? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Well, Tibor and I were going over the footage and obviously by this point, viewers will have seen the footage for themselves, but it was obvious to us that you were terrified in that situation when you got in the car. Um, yeah, that's a fair assessment of the, of the situation. Um, what was going through your mind? Well, because suddenly it's, there's, um, questions or, or, or you're not safe anywhere anymore. So Bethel, like if Bethel see me in filming something, that's a, that's a big problem for me mm. currently. Mm. It's just all of a sudden you're, you're facing uneasiness on all sides. So it just take what, maybe one cyclist from Bethel to go by, to see you, to see you filming, go, that's Ben, what's going on? Problem. On the other side for me, I don't know any of you. This is all very new. Are these guys going to throw me off a cliff? Or... So everywhere is now uneasy. And going from, from Bethel day in, day out, you know exactly where you're going, what you're doing, who you're going to see, what you're going to eat, to this world of uneasiness in like six steps was, was um, an experience. <laughs> you were telling me more facets of your story. And I hope you don't mind me saying on camera, I learned that you're not just a Bethelite, you're also gay mm -hmm. and an elder. Right. So that for me is, I think that's a really important element of your story because number one, there'll be many Jehovah's Witnesses and ex-Jehovah's Witnesses watching this who have had their lives ruined through the organization's stance on homosexuality and also the fact that you you were an elder or are an elder sorry still <laughs> at this pre precise moment that's correct um it's important again to highlight just how how possible it is to be in a position of you know respect and authority in the organization and still be able to develop doubts so um talk us through what it's been like to be in the organization, in the center of the organization as a Bethelite, and be supporting a religion that's essentially denying who you are as a person. Yeah, so um, I guess you just, well, I can't speak for other people, but for me, I um, came to terms pretty early on that this is just something that it wasn't a question of, oh my goodness, my religion doesn't fit who I am. It's, oh, I, there is something wrong 
with me and I need to change that to fit the true religion, you know? Um, so I came to terms with that pretty early on and didn't really like fully reconsider that whole conversation I had had with myself until like after I'd woken up. That was really important actually that I didn't have any bias considering everything because I, I ha would naturally have a, um, a bias towards wanting it to be untrue because then it would f let me be free in a sense. Um, but that would then, I felt, taint my judgment. So it really, any time that I would even think, oh, wait a sec, that might mean this, it was like, no, I, I don't want to think about that because that's going to make me want to or lean in a direction. So I was very much, uh, that came after the waking up process for me. It's like this realization that you haven't got to like, hide away, I guess is the right terminology. You were convinced that the problem was with you um, yeah. rather than it being an issue with, you know, religion in general or the Bible or specifically Jehovah's Witnesses. And it must have been particularly grating or upsetting or distressing when Stephen Lett gave that talk. I was thinking, as an example, a homosexual. Now, this former homosexual comes back in the resurrection, and he really thought and he, he was taught and he came to believe that God accepted him with that lifestyle. But now he's going to learn about Jehovah's moral standards. And he's going to learn that Jehovah will not lower his standard to accommodate us. We have to come up to Jehovah's standard. Will he change? Will he adjust? It'll be up to him. But you brothers and sisters will help such ones. So what was it like actually watching that talk as someone who has who had this conflict yeah. you know this this religious conflict with his sexuality what was it like watching that talk and hearing that all of a sudden actually you can be resurrected into a perfect body with this quote unquote anomaly with this defect is, is how they see it yeah there was <laughs> so much has happened since then yeah. but i i I knew that like previously witnesses had said like maybe this date's going to be up again. It hadn't turned out and like people who weren't strong enough in the truth had left over it and things like that. And I, you know, that they, those were kind of facts to me and okay, I knew that happened. And then during that talk, it was the first time I could actually, I got that feeling because all of a sudden it was like for, for 26 years, I guess, in that case, the, it's like, okay, if you, once you get to paradise, you're, you know, you're good. So, you know, constant fear that you're not going to get to paradise. But if you do, then you're good. You've done it. Good job. Everyone has challenges and you've overcome it. But, but then when you sit there and just in a moment and, and not even like a big, showstopper announcement where everyone's like oh can you believe that talk where this happened just in almost a passing statement the whole my whole future changed to oh no no you thought you had to get to paradise but now you've got to get to paradise and then do a thousand year and still work on this issue right yeah like the 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 murderer down the road like if he does all the right stuff he comes back and he's great Mm. But you, who who knew the truth, knew the true God, did everything right, did you know, went through the challenge, have a thousand years. So like you think it's hard at twenty six. Like mm. if suddenly every the whole future changed just based on this comment, mm. and it it was a m amazing moment of like, this, this could change. This changed in a moment, and like anything can change at any time. Mm. And like, I wasn't questioning if that was kind of true or not at that stage. It was just a, but you can, you can just change it. Like I can't, ch I can't say, well, I'd like this, or I think actually this means that, but, but they can, they can just come out with a talk and say, yeah, I mean, there's not going to be lions in paradise and your dream is just shattered mm. because that's now what, what you believe. And that was a really, uh, yeah, really, 
<laughs> powerful moment, I think. I was fascinated by the story. I, I hope you don't mind if I... Please. Because it's all flooding back to me now. Uh -huh. Tell us about the $5,000 thing, because you were involved in... Your whole job was, you know, managing the budgeting of video projects. And what you said was that there, there are actual policies for how to deal with various things, including a policy for what to do if a cast member disfellowships, yeah. gets disfellowshipped or disassociated, which hasn't happened yet. To my knowledge. To, to our knowledge, yeah. but there's a policy in place for if that happens. And there's also kind of like a price list of how much, how much to budget for certain types of video. And you, the last one you worked on was, I think, the, the one from this year's convention uh, about the circuit overseer who's single and brothers are pestering him to not be single basically <laughs> and you were involved in that project and that was the five thousand that was a five thousand uh, dollar project wasn't it um yes so, so that kind of production typically is mm. is that's you depending on the type of production you'll get generally a, a standardized budget so mm. like a dramatization something like that this kind of project for on a christian singles um is typically uh, about 5,000, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, but again, there's kind of interesting scenarios or um, interesting nuance to that as well. Like a Caleb and Sophia video, you think, well, that's probably going to cost a lot of money because of all the animation. But in actuality, it doesn't cost anything because you just put some Beth lights in a room <laughs> yeah. and say, work on this for this long. And Everything's done in computer programs. Exactly, yeah. which you've already got. So the budget is nothing. Mm. Whereas maybe a nice little animal video, they're not going to go and shoot these animals. They need to buy that footage and that will cost uh, extremely more than maybe even more than a, than a dramatization. So yeah, so the, the uh, budgeting thing, I'm, <laughs> I'm careful not to say so much that I then get sued out of existence. You can't get beer in the London Bethel. No. But in the German Bethel, they're so determined to have beer that they've let someone set up a, an actual shop as their business. Right. Selling beer directly to Bethelites on Bethel premises. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I, the majority of the shop, I think, is probably beer. I mean, that fits. It's, it's, I'm not complaining and I don't <laughs> think it should change. Yeah. But it's, but it's a huge difference, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, night and day. Yeah. yeah. And I also love the story, and it's all coming back to me now, <laughs> the, the real WOL, WOL, the real Watchtower online library yeah. that is accessible to Bethelites goes all the way back to, I think, 1860? I, don't, I can't remember the exact date, but it goes back, yeah. Into That's the really 19th interesting. century. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, you, you were making the point that Jehovah's Witnesses might think, well, the reason why we only go back to 1950 for the Watchtowers and 1970 for the Awakes and for the books and booklets is because, you know, it would be too much work to put all of those extra decades, you know, digitally available online. But you're yeah. saying the work's it's already been done. It's already available, but only to Bethelites. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the things that I'll cover first in a video is, is mm. that was really interesting because I had reasoned that way that like the reason that you can't get to all of the older stuff is not necessarily because it's got damning things in it it's just because I mean that's a lot of work you know to go mm. in because you can't just you know scan the pdf and upload it you've got to make sure the text is correct and it's a whole process of of digitalizing old books that may not be super legible anymore if your copy's not clean or that's a, a huge amount of work and so that would for me was a logical conclusion but yeah when they announced that oh you know now you can now that you've got Bethel access to this and it's all just there that was really interesting then what you can suddenly or is available to you but like, why is it available to me yeah. and not to someone else? Why available to Bethelites but not available to ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah, and I think even you have, it's, you have to be a Bethel elder to get access to it. So it's oh, like really? another, it's, it is just odd. Like why, why is that the level? I mean, like with apostasy, it's like, well, there's no level where 
where you're strong enough to, to resist that. So don't look at it, no matter who you are. But apparently there's a, something similar with the, like your, your normal witnesses shouldn't read it, but there's a level that you can get to where now you're able to get to this information, which I find an interesting policy or interesting stance on it. It's, for, it's irritating for me as well, because, you know, bear in mind, you have this really strong anti-apostate rhetoric where they're saying, you know, the apostates are out to mislead you. Yeah. You know, they're saying things that are laced with truth, but mostly it's lies, and they're basically withholding information. Another way we can contribute to the oneness, rejecting false stories that are designed to separate us from Jehovah's organization. As an example, think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? Just a few drops of poison in a drink are enough to cause serious harm. And apostates often mix a few truths with the uh, lies. For one thing, we must reject apostate lies and the false stories of other opposers, which are designed to sow doubt and weaken faith. Satan is very skilled at using innuendo, half-truths, and lies. And yet here you have an organization that has all of its publications available digitally, but won't make them available to the ordinary. Is literally actively withholding that information. And I think we all know why. Mm. It's because it's utterly damning. You know, the 1934 yearbook, Declaration of Facts, Rutherford saying what he thinks of Jewish people. If most Jehovah's Witnesses read that on their screens, on their... Tablets or whatever. Mm. That would be, wow. I did not know it was that kind of organization back then, you know. Two or three days before we got you out, mm -hmm. um, you... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you found yourself in a very stressful situation and we had a WhatsApp exchange and it was all looking very scary. Can you relive some of that and, and explain what happened? <laughs> I will try. Um, yeah, so... Um, oh, man. Is this bringing back <clears throat> memories now? It's, yeah. it's, a, it's uncomfortable, yeah. So... Yeah, to tell a long story short, I, um, I'm trying to think about what I should say. Yeah, I understand, because other people are involved in the story and you, you're right. wanting to think about what their wishes are. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's fair to say that um, a very good friend of mine um, where went on a journey went on the journey with me mm. and then um came up with a plan and was executing that plan it didn't go quite as um as planned and so then it raised some suspicion in bethel about apostasy and um the spreading of misinformation and so on so I, I was uh, called into a meeting with um, some elders that I know very, very well and kind of, for lack of a better word, grilled about the situation, about this very, very close friend, about their current s stance, what they're thinking, contact with them, what I think, do I have doubts, what's my situation, have I been looking at anything apostate, et cetera, et cetera. But that was not... I was not aware that that's where this meeting, I thought it was like a, thanks for coming to Bethel, see you later. Oh, so it was a total surprise from what you had in mind. Complete, yeah. yeah. So I was very, in fact, I was prepared for, well, in all honesty, I was prepared for a meeting of, you know, thanks for, do you have any suggestions or anything that we could have done better? I kind of had prepared like, well, I think, you know, you should do this and this is a bit naff. And, yeah. And... At the beginning, there was all these questions about, you know, how I feel about kind of people in power and so, and I was, ex that's how I, I expected this conversation to go. So I, I was pretty honest. I was like, well, I'm going to be honest. Some of them are, I don't know why they have this. 
um, which in hindsight was not a great answer to be given. If you'd have known what direction it was going to go in, you would have... <laughs> oh, would have, they, they're fantastic. Yes. The brothers are, are wonderful. Yes, and... but I thought it was a bit... Um, <laughs> they caught me off guard. Yeah. Um, and it was very... And then all of a sudden it became very clear. I, they, they were directly talking about this to me, like watching my reactions and how I reacted to their questions and everything. And I didn't know... Um, if they knew what they knew, if this is me, if this is someone else that I'm aware of, or what, what this, what's the situation? Mm. Fortunately, I, I don't know how, because I clearly, <laughs> from this conversation, I struggle to form sentences. So in a high stress situation where every word is very carefully um, over, back to over yeah. analyzed, right? Yeah. Somehow, I managed to dodge the bullet, I guess, and and um, you were able to reassure them that you weren't <laughs> part of this infestation of apostasy due mm. to this friend of yours who who'd gotten out and was making apparently very. Um, distressing noises from the organization's perspective. Yeah, which is, I really, it really, it, it, I don't get annoyed <laughs> really ever, but I guess that's as close as I get because it's, because I'm forced to lie. Mm. Like it wasn't like, look, you can be, even though they say, look, you can be totally honest here. If I'm totally honest, say, well, Lloyd's coming to pick me up <laughs> in two days. <laughs> that doesn't go well. No. So, so you so you just, you have to lie and you can't, it's not just lying on a form mm. or lying to someone at the post office. Yeah. It's, it's lying to two people you've known for six years. That you like and that you care about. Very much. Yeah. And, and to their faces mm. in a conversation where they've asked you to be brutally honest. It's a horrible. It, this is why it's so uncomfortable because I'm, I guess my, my conscience is so ashamed that I've done that. It's, it, Even though you know why you did it. Yeah, but it's still, this is something we were chatting about in the car, is the relationships you make in Bethel, the, the, still in my mind, I can't say all, but at least my friends or the people I hanged around with Bethel, I love very much, like even still. And I know they're never going to wake up and this, it's over. But these are, in my mind, inherently good people who don't, simply just don't understand um, and will likely never. And they're your friends and family and they're who you go to when your parents are sick and you can't go home or when you're struggling in lockdown because you're, you just want to go to the cinema or something. They, they help you through everything. And when you're put in a position where you have to knowingly lie and then know that they're going to find out and they're going to remember that conversation and think, this guy's horrible, he's lied to my... It's very... Uh, it's probably... I, f I don't think it's an over-exaggeration to say it's probably the most awful I felt about s something I think I've done. I feel so ashamed about it. Even though I understand why and I know why and and it's not for fear of not getting into paradise or anything anymore. It, it, it's, it's just a horrible, like if you imagine that you, that you have a very good relationship with people and someone's looked after you and every, I think most people have someone in their life like that and you're forced to lie knowing that they're gonna find out, hate you, never speak to you again and not something you prepared for, it happens in conversation. Mm. And, and there are dramatic consequences if you don't Tell them what they want to that, hear. Yeah. yeah. It's a horrible situation to be in. Mm. And I, in some ways, am thankful, I think, that I probably will never have to deal. Like, if they wake up and I have to, or oh, I'm able to talk to them, that would, I think it will haunt me forever, that conversation. Is that, was that? 
it was that element of of it, the deception, the most traumati traumatizing element of the whole situation for you. Yes, because because it's just not in my nature. I, yeah. I mean, every, sure, no one's like well. It it. People, not many people are like, oh, I love lying to people. It is, I, it's just uncomfortable being deceptive and, and just lying to your friends. It's horrible. I, mm. I, I mean, you could argue, I guess, I'm trying to think how I would think watching myself speak. It's like, well, you lied to yourself about being gay for 20 years, but it's, it's you're deceiving others. Like every day when you get up in Bethel and you're not, you don't fully believe in what's happening. It's very draining, but it's also, I felt like you're deceiving everyone. Like the days when I could take holiday or, or for whatever reason weren't at work were such a relief because you can just, you don't, you just, you're not lying about the situation. So then to, at the very last minute, be confronted, which I hadn't had before, directly in the face. I mean, it, many people have, will have had judicials and things of that, and that's already uncomfortable. But when you're an elder and you know these guys very well, you know all the challenges and situations they've been through in their personal lives, in the stuff they've dealt with judicially or whatever before, and, and they're your friends and you've built a, a close relationship with them, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. It's just so uncomfortable. And, uh, yeah, I... You're, you're still trying to get your head around it. That's, that's yeah. still, that's probably, I don't think I will, like, this week or this, I yeah. think it will take some time to get over that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Because it was quite, it's a position that I don't ever want to be in again. No. There was a, a definite company that I always wanted to work for. And... Um, and it would be great if I could be somehow involved in th that whole world and, and technology. And so to pursue that dream is a very long journey. And so the f one of the first steps is um, either to learn um, how that world to is. Learn those skills. Learn the skills. Um, and so the route that I kind of have chosen to go about is then to to attend university. Higher education. To, <laughs> you're waiting. <laughs> it is one thing to work on a job with others and quite another matter to immerse oneself in an institution of learning. I have long said, the better the university, the greater the danger. The most intelligent and eloquent professors will be trying to reshape the thinking of your child and their influence can be tremendous. Yes, um, to obtain the skills to, to make that dream a reality, even if it doesn't go exactly as planned, going on that journey is, is really exciting. At the moment, my feelings are so overshadowed by the last thing we spoke about that everything is so still quite doomy and, and emotional but I'm really looking forward to actually doing that and yeah. and and being hopefully at some point able to say yeah I can I can code now and I can do this and understand science and and mm. and that's super interesting to me well all I can say is it's been an absolute privilege I know we use that word a lot, or we used it as Jehovah's Witnesses a lot, but it's been a real privilege watching and helping you on your journey. I am fascinated to see where things go in the future, fascinated to see what videos you make, and probably more than anything, fascinated to see you build a new life where you can be true to yourself and you can explore your dreams, love whoever you want to love, and just, yeah, enjoy life, enjoy this brilliant thing called life. But... I guess all that remains is to say congratulations on your freedom. Thanks. And we're here for you. Thank okay. you.
the experience of helping Ben leave Bethel and being among the first to welcome him to a new, authentic life brimming with the potential for meaning and happiness has been one of the biggest privileges of my 10 years as an ex-Jehovah's Witness activist. Here is a courageous man who has fought his way beyond his comfort zone and made difficult, heart-wrenching decisions in order to forge a new life for himself. One where he can love freely without guilt or fear and chase his dreams. In doing so, I know he'll inspire other Jehovah's Witnesses, both inside and outside of Bethel, to follow suit. Ben is living proof that no matter how much a group or set of ideas may control you, to the point of dictating even the most intimate aspects of your life, the promise of freedom always lies just over the horizon, and it is always worth fighting for. We're driving a car. Oh, who does? Do you just drive over some pile of nappies? Like a pile of nappies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they were very solid, weren't they? You may feel trapped in a web of lies, even though you were woke. But there are many here among us who know the watchtower is a joke. Tell the real truth now. The time is getting late. Yeah. Don't know how to say this, but I fear Tibor may be going a little bit mad. He said he needed some time to himself and uh, he's gone off wandering into the field. Centric fellow, brilliant video editor, but sometimes you just get the feeling you might be unraveling a little bit. Yeah, he said he said he needed time to himself. I don't know whether he's just doing a week. Kind of an extreme length to go to to, uh, to do that, but yeah. It takes all sorts to do activism, that's what I've learned. And you can't be choosy. You've got to work with what you're given. And uh, in this case, uh, yeah, have a, a video editor who just randomly walks into fields to be with himself. Not judging. All along the watchtower, they cling to their views, ignoring all the pain they cause, turning blind as to States unite to win back our families and bring shadow to light. Yeah. This is a bit embarrassing. My colleague Tibor is obsessed with turquoise things. It seems. That's a, this, We've gone from him wandering into fields for unknown reasons to stopping to take pictures of almost anything he sees that is of a certain colour. Uh, turquoise is the best colour followed by purple, so... Oh, oh, oh. Is a hater. This is, this is the 